This final week is really about full length exams and detailed review of those exams. Nothing more, nothing less. This is not the time to try a totally new course of action or a totally new approach. This is not the time if you've been reading the stimulus first to start reading the question stem first in logical reasoning, for example, or to start doing a totally new diagramming strategy for logic games. This is about just rinse and repeat what you've been doing over the past few months at least. I, hopefully you've been studying for at least a few months, if not more. So regardless, this final week is about just doing timed exams and timed sections and review of those. And so I'm gonna send you actually a customized plan I've put together specifically for what to do in the final week starting tomorrow. So tomorrow, Wednesday, take a full length timed exam or a few time practice sections and review them. Then take a day off along with maybe a little bit of review. Then Friday, take another timed exam. Saturday, review it. Sunday, rest. Monday, go in and destroy it. And of course, also make sure that you're properly taking care of yourself. So sleep, diet, exercise, exercise, mindfulness, relaxation, all of those are extremely important not to be overlooked. If any one of those things is not totally in sync and in check, then you're likely to run into problems on test day. The LSAT requires that you be 100% on your game. If you're even a little bit tired or hungover, or you're having some family crisis or emergency or something with a significant other, let's say you had a fight with somebody right before walking into the test, that could of course affect your performance. So definitely I would say, make sure all everything in your personal life is squared away as much as possible and you take this final week to get it all squared away if anything is not already. So if you can take Friday off from work, obviously if you're working, you're, you'll take Monday off because you're taking the exam Monday, but if you could take Thursday or Friday off and just relax, make it a longer restful weekend, definitely do that. Go for a walk in the park, take a hot bath, get, get a massage, do yoga, whatever relaxes you, I would suggest doing that. If you go on my YouTube channel, I actually have a, a relaxation and meditation playlist. I also have a test day mindset playlist, and I'll pull those up for you and just put them in the chat here because I do think this stuff is often too overlooked, but it's actually really important. So I'm going to share both of those playlists with you here, one for motivation and one for relaxation, meditation, mindfulness, all that good stuff. If you haven't been meditating, I would certainly recommend it. Even just five minutes a day can make an enormous impact, even just the next couple of days, the next week. And I know this schedule I've laid out for you might look a little bit light. You might be saying, could I do nothing more than two full length timed exams in this final week? Would that be enough? And I'd say, honestly, that is enough. And if you review the way I recommend reviewing, which is in a tremendous amount of detail, then that's great then that will be more than enough. Otherwise, you could do a single exam. You could do, I wouldn't do three exams, that'd be too many, but real review takes time. Let's say you got 10 questions wrong and got a 170 on a practice test, but there were another 15 where you guessed and maybe you got a little bit lucky. Those are still well worth reviewing. And so you've got 25 questions to, to potentially review that could easily take three to four hours or longer if you're doing it properly which really is a full day of study. I recommend for any full day of study where you're not working, you're not in classes or whatever, you're just focused on your LSAT studying, five, six hours max in a day where you're doing three hours before lunch, three hours after lunch, that's it. You're done by four and you're good for the day. So you, let's say you're waking up seven, eight o'clock. I know for some people that's a dream, but if you can get there, that's ideal. You start studying 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., hour-long break for lunch, study one to four, that's it. Frequent breaks throughout. I strongly recommend something called the Pomodoro Technique. I'm typing the name of that in the chat so you can check it out. It's basically cycles of work and breaks so that you're not tempted to check your phone or email or internet or whatever else because you know you have a five-minute break coming up relatively soon. If you want this in app form, there's a great app called the Focus app that helps you to, to work on this. I've also heard good things about something called the Forest app to help you focus on whatever work you wanna get done. Of course, in this case, what you wanna get done 
is LSAT studying. Now let's see what else. In terms of test day mindset, test day prep, a couple of things to be thinking about in this final week. First off, let's dial down the stress just a little bit. No one particular LSAT test date will make or break you. So don't put all your eggs in this basket of July in particular if you're taking it in July. First of all, the July LSAT is of course incredibly unique because this is the transitional LSAT from paper to digital, meaning that LSAC has extended a few olive branches to those of you taking it. First off, they're letting you see your score before you decide whether to cancel, which is the first and only time in the LSAT history they're doing this. And second of all, if you do cancel, you will get a free retake on a future LSAT administration from October through April 2020. And so law school admission officers will be expecting people to cancel and will not be at all surprised to see cancellations on record for anyone taking it in July. So don't think it's all about this one test. While the LSAT as a whole is incredibly important, no one particular LSAT test date will make or break you. You will always have future retake opportunities. And of course, for July in particular, that's still very early in the cycle. So you could take it in September, October, or November and still apply early enough in the cycle that it will not really hurt you in any significant way. And besides, if you got even just a single point more on the LSAT by taking it in the fall, in addition or instead or what have you, it'd be well worth applying a little bit later in the cycle to get that gain. Now, we wanna let go of any one particular test date. Similarly, during the exam itself, you don't wanna to get too focused on any one particular LSAT question. Don't get bogged down or stuck on any one question and think it's the end of the world. Everything is worth the same. And while logical reasoning, for example, is presented in a general order of difficulty, it's not a perfect order of difficulty. Questions 23 to 26 in a logical reasoning section could actually be a little bit easier than those that came in the late teens and early 20s. Regardless, feel free to flag questions and come back to them later. Don't put all your eggs in one basket for any single question. If you're not making headway on a question after a minute or two, just skip it, come back to it later. I'll typically, personally, I'll flag three to five questions in a logical reasoning section to come back to at the end, and I'm working at a fast enough pace where I see a question I don't like, if it's a lengthy parallel or principal application or something on a topic that I don't like, maybe science, maybe philosophy, maybe art, I'll just skip it, come back at the end. The digital LSAT actually has a really cool flagging feature to help you mark off questions to come back to. I'll show you that in a little bit. Now for test day, there's some silly mistakes I want you to avoid. First off, you have to bring a government issued ID that is not expired. So not your university ID and not some old expired ID. It must be current and the name on the government issued ID must exactly match the name on your LSAT admission ticket. So if you got married and changed your name, or if there's a misspelling on your admission ticket versus your government ID, contact LSAC now, get that addressed. You can always email them at lsacinfo at lsac.org and check this out now, not later. They are not going to be responding to emails immediately at 12.30 p.m. on Monday afternoon. They typically have a turnaround of 24 to 48 hours or longer, and over the weekend, even longer than that. So email them now so that you have a few days to get this resolved. Of course, you could call them as well, but you're not going to reach them on the weekend, and you're not going to be calling them from the test center most likely. So get this addressed now. There's no need to be denied entry to the test center for something silly like this. Another silly thing to avoid is waiting till the end to bubble. If you get the paper format in July, you're still using your Scantron with the number two pencils. And so don't wait till the end to bubble and practice bubbling now. It does take probably a couple minutes per section. And so add that to your time constraint if you're wanting to properly simulate test day conditions, which of course I do recommend. Bubbling is part of that. If you're doing two timed exams in the next week before July, maybe make one paper and the other digital. And if you're taking in the fall, of course, you don't have to worry about that. And you're, you're taking in North America, of course, you will be getting digital. But it is worth being comfortable with both formats. When you get to the test center, regardless of the format you're getting, 
try to avoid other people. Don't talk to other people. You don't know what they're going to say. People have big egos. They're not always telling the truth. And you never know what they could say that could kind of set you off a little bit or stress you out. So just focus on yourself. Bring some warm-up questions to do, to do at the test center. Or let's say if, if, if it's at a university or a hotel, you could do it in the lobby, the waiting area, or a coffee shop nearby, or in the car before you enter. Of course, you'll have to toss those questions before you go in. But at least you'll have a little bit of a warm-up so that the first questions you're doing on test day are not actual scored LSAT questions that count. This could be a favorite logic game favorite reading comprehension passage, a couple logical reasoning questions, nothing hard, nothing you haven't seen before. This is just a way to get your brain a little bit warmed up before walking in. And yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. You, again, like I said, take a timed exam Thursday or, or Thursday, Friday, or Saturday, maybe Thursday and Saturday or Wednesday and Saturday, rest Sunday, walk in Monday with the attitude that you're just going to destroy this exam and that you know this exam better than 99% of people in there. And chances are you probably do. Most people actually walk in having never taken it before, not even a practice test because a pre-law advisor told them to go in just to take it and see how they'll do, which is bad advice, of course, but people do that. People don't study that much. And so if you, if you are studying, if you're in this class right now, then you're way ahead of most people. And so if you want to go to the next level beyond that, I've got a YouTube playlist specifically focused on test day prep, what to bring, what not to bring what to do the week before, the day before, the day of, the day after. And of course, we can be in touch afterwards and I'll have future classes on this, what to do after the exam on, or as far as cancellations and retakes are concerned. But don't even worry too much about that right now. The, I'll talk about it a bit, but overall the point is that you just walk in, that like if you're taking July, this is the test that you're gonna dominate and you know this material well enough that you're gonna do well on it. So of course, we talked a little bit about July, what makes it unique. It's the transitional exam from paper to digital. Half of test takers will get the digital format, half get paper, LSAC chooses for you, and you don't get prior notice, which is why they're giving you these bonuses of the free retake and letting you see your score before deciding whether to cancel. Now in terms of prep, of course, it won't be on a, on a computer, it'll be on a tablet, specifically a Microsoft Surface Go. 10 inch screen, Microsoft Surface Go. So if you wanna practice the digital format, I would say use a tablet. Doesn't have to be the Microsoft one specifically. Any old tablet will do. So it could be an iPad, a Samsung. If you have the Microsoft one, that's great. But if you want a more affordable option, I've got one here for you. This is a Amazon Fire tablet and it's about 150 bucks on Amazon. So it's not the cheapest thing ever, but it also won't necessarily break the bank. And Amazon has a pretty good return policy. So if you decide that you don't like it after the exam, you could always return it. They'll probably take it back. And this is good enough to work with LSAC's familiarization tool at familiar.lsac.org, where they have put on their three LSAT prep tests, exams 71, 73, and 74, that you can do in the digital interactive format. If you wanna play around with the digital LSAT features like highlighting, underlining, um, collapsing answer choices, flagging choices, et cetera. And I actually wanna share that with you a little bit so we, could, so we could see what it looks like together. So this is familiar.lsat.org and they have put this useful tool out here so we can actually see what it looks like. So you see here, they've got, this is meant to simulate the directions but the countdown clock is actually starting already. So we've just gone to the questions. We've got, this is where the stimulus might be. And this is where the questions might be. So you see, we can underline things in the stimulus. We can highlight things in the stimulus. We can highlight in multiple colors, yellow, pink, and orange. Although you can't highlight overlays of highlighters. So you can't combine yellow and orange to make some new color. It's just one color at a time. And you can't highlight under, and underline the same thing as well. If I underline it, it erases the highlighting, but you can erase what you notate, which is pretty cool. And if we skip ahead to question number two, for example, and we go back to question one, our highlighting and underlining is still there, which is kind of cool. You can select a choice and it'll appear bubbled in on the bottom. You can eliminate a choice and it'll kind of get grayed out. You can also reveal the answer only on the familiarization tool, not on the actual digital LSAT on test day, of course. 
but still some pretty cool things to play around with. If this were a longer question, you see that we'd have to scroll down to see all five choices, but you can collapse an answer choice. So you see I've eliminated E and now it's kind of grayed out and they've kind of removed a little, much of the text there. So if you want to eliminate something and kind of remove it from your field of vision to simplify what you're looking at, you can do that, which is pretty cool. You can also increase text size, which is meant to be an um, accessibility feature for those who have site issues. You can also increase the line spacing if you want to kind of spread things out a bit more, if that makes it easier for you. The downside is that you have to scroll up and down a bit more. So that could be a little time consuming and maybe not desirable for you. Something to keep in mind. For reading comp, it's a little bit different where you have the passage, you have to scroll up and down to see the entire thing, or you could see the passage only. But the downside is you cannot see the passage and the questions at the same time if you display it in this way. So if I go back to see the passage with the question, I won't be able to see the entire question, the entire passage at once. So it's all about trade offs here. It's not the perfect interface but this isn't the worst thing in the world. One cool thing is that if they're calling your attention to a specific keyword and then you see they've highlighted it in blue here, I guess that's blue, I don't know what to call it, turquoise maybe, but if you scroll down, we've got that same color highlighted here in the passage as well to make it easier to recognize. So this is kind of like an analog to a line reference number or a keyword that they're referencing. They, may, they do make it easier for you so that you don't have to hunt around as much. And you see that this, this is pretty much the format. Again, the highlighting and the underlining are the main things that I think will interest most people. And notice you can even highlight the question stem and the answer choices as well. Pretty cool. So I know I've said a lot here. I want to make sure I'm addressing any questions that you might have. So feel free to use the Q&A function or the chat here to ask questions on anything I've talked about so far, whether it's test day prep or digital LSAT prep in particular. I have plenty more I can talk about, but I just wanted to take a moment to make sure I'm covering your questions as well. So do feel free to ask away on those. I do have some other things I can talk about that I'll jump into though. I do see one question here. How to get over test day and pre-test nerves? Great question. So as far as how to get over nerves and anxiety, a couple of things. One of them is to, as an exercise, remember that it's not all about this one particular test. So let's say if you're taking in July, but you also know that you're registered for September, that's a great way to get some peace of mind. So even if you weren't planning on taking it in the fall, it could be worth shelling out the 200 bucks just to know that you are secure in your test center registration for the fall, that you have a test center locked down, you're good to go. You're not going to miss the deadline. You're not going to have to take it somewhere super inconvenient. You know that you've got this test center ready if you want it. And hey, you know, retaking is well worth it because if you get even a single point more, that could lead to thousands of dollars in scholarship money or getting into a better law school. And law schools don't average multiple scores. They only take the highest. And the funny thing with LSAT scores is that you have a margin of error or a score band of three and a half points on either end, meaning that even if your ability and understanding of this exam did not change in any way at all, you could do three points better or four points better. And how many more doors would that open for you? And so however July goes, if you're taking it in July, I'd say, don't worry. It probably makes sense for you to take it in the fall as well. And there is this new retake limit LSAC has implemented, but it's loose enough that it's not going to affect that many people. LSAC says, it will affect less than 1% of test takers. And I, I do believe that, honestly. I'll show you what I'm talking about here. They've added this new constraint in part because they, they are offering the LSAT more frequently than they used to, meaning that they'll have to reuse old tests, more, old tests that they haven't released yet more and more. So you can take it three times in a single testing year, five times in the past five years, seven times in your lifetime, going forward, starting with September. So whatever you've done up to this point, even including July, will not affect that count. But three times in the year, that's plenty, honestly. And LSAC is also not counting withdrawals. So if you take it and you withdraw, or if you, if you register and you withdraw your test registration, 
before and you don't go to the test center, you don't take it that day, that will not count towards your limit. Also, I'd say as an exercise, remember that you got to look at the big picture once again, what's going to happen three to five years from now if the July LSAT goes well for you versus if it doesn't go well. If it goes well, of course, that's fantastic. Maybe you're done for the LSAT for, excuse me, you're done with it for good. You move on with your life. You work on your personal statement. You apply. You have a year to wait before law school. Awesome. Otherwise, it doesn't go well. Hey, well, you've got the fall. You've got September and October and November. And you could theoretically take all three of those if you wanted to. You wouldn't be able to take it in the spring then, of course, due to this new limit. But you have plenty of opportunities available to you. And law schools, once again, they don't average multiple LSAT scores. They only take the highest. Once again, for more, I would look at the test day relaxation playlist I, I put in the chat here and the motivation playlist as well for, for more guidance on this sort of thing. Again, I do highly recommend mindfulness meditation. Even just five minutes a day makes a huge difference. Someone asked, is it worth brushing up on the weird logic games for the July LSAT? Like mapping games, pattern games, circle games. Great question. And I'd say yes, it's always worth being fresh on the weird games because you never know what could happen. But I would focus more on making sure you've mastered all the regular game types, ordering, grouping, combinations of those game types, all the standard stuff first, then brush up on the weird games as well, like pattern, circle, mapping, etc., and so on. I've actually got a list of curveball games that I will share with you here because I think it's worth focusing on those in the final week, assuming, of course, that you've mastered the regular stuff. And so I'll share this with you as well. This, this list covers everything from 1 to 80-something, so it's fairly comprehensive. But honestly, I suspect that for the July LSAT, they're not going to do anything super crazy because this is the transitional exam, and people are, are already likely to be potentially thrown off a little bit by the digital format or just not knowing what they're going to get. Of course, you're prepping for both paper and digital simultaneously. They're not likely to, that, that, that is the curveball to me. There's not a curveball beyond that, that, that they want to throw at you. It's like, they don't, they don't want to make you juggle plates during an earthquake. Juggling plates is hard enough as it is without an earthquake thrown into the mix. So I think that they're going to just leave it to be pretty standard. And the June LSAT as well was also pretty standard for the, as being the last paper LSAT. There wasn't anything too crazy at that test. And I think July LSAT also won't be super crazy is my prediction. But never say never. It is worth brushing up on curveball games as well just to be safe. And yeah, so I'd say maybe do a couple of the most recent exams. Like let's say you do in this final week tests 86 and 87 as your full-length type exams. And then you do, of course, experimentals for maybe other exams in the 80s. But on your off days, do some curveball games from this list I'm providing you here. I wouldn't inordinately focus on them. But if you haven't looked at a mapping game in a while or a pattern game or a circle game in a while, I do think it's worth looking at those a little bit. And then, of course, you can look at explanations as well, just so that you're going to the exam feeling confident that there's nothing that you're majorly missing or confused by. So I hope that addresses those questions. Happy to entertain follow-ups. Let's see what else. So again, like I said, practice for digital LSAT on a tablet. Any old tablet will do. Go on familiar.lsac.org and play around with those three exams. If you want, you could do one, one of your two-timed exams in this final week could be on the digital LSAT interface at familiar.lsac.org. The other one could be using a, a book or a PDF of some other exam, doing the old-fashioned paper and pencil format, printing it out and, what, and whatnot. For the digital format, you are going to get scratch paper, about 14 pages, although LSAC has not confirmed the exact number of pages specifically, but they previously did say around 14, so I'm guessing it'll be around 14, which means that, of course, when you're prepping for digital, do your work in a notebook or scratch paper on the side. It'll be unlined eight and a half by 11, so not a lined notebook, not unlimited either. 14 pages approximately, eight and a half by 11 paper, and you can't draw freehand on the screen, so treat your exams like they were PDFs, like they were a screen, but you can't write with them, write on them with a pencil or a pen 
like you could on a regular piece of paper. And so that raises the question, of course, of how you might want to deal with diagramming digital LSAT when you're using scratch paper to the side. So I'm going to share with you what I would do. This is a little mock-up of what my logic games layout might look like. You've got your rules, your main diagram, individual question diagrams. So concise and clean, neatly organized, although your handwriting might be better than mine. But the point is that you've got it laid out in a systematic structure that looks the same every single time. You want to have it laid out in a way that where you could look back at it a week or two from now and you would know exactly what you were looking at. You'd be able to interpret it perfectly. The other thing you saw with the digital LSAT is that you can only see one question at a time. How do you simulate that? I basically take a cutout. So I cut out a hole in a piece of paper, a little rectangle, and then I overlay that on top of a digital, of a, of a regular LSAT question in my book to limit my field of vision to seeing only one question at a time. You don't need to go overboard on this, of course. I, if you don't do any of this stuff, I think it's fine. You'll probably be okay. Of course, the LSAT is not changing from a content perspective. It's only changing from a delivery perspective. The format is changing. So I wouldn't worry too much, but of course, I know type A future lawyers when I see them. And so if you want to do this and go the extra mile, you're certainly welcome to. And just to contrast that with the old format, it used to be a one-page layout for games where everything was limited and you only had this little space on the bottom here. Then they spread it out across two pages, starting with test 66. So you had a bit more. And now you've got a full eight and a half by 11 page. You could have one page per game and then plenty of other pages for reading comp and logical reasoning if you wanted to. I've got someone asking about glitches and things like that. I actually anticipate this question, so I've got something here for you on that. What happens if something goes wrong on the digital LSAT? This is a, a screenshot from LSAC's site. What if a tablet malfunctions? What if the battery dies? They're basically saying here that the test proctors will have other tablets on backup so they can give you a new one if you need it. And they're saving things every 10 seconds to the supervisor's hub. So everything you do will be preserved. Of course, realistically, what happens if something goes wrong and they're not able to correct it at, on, on time at the digital LSAT, then what's basically going to happen is that you'll likely have to retake it on a future LSAT administration. Of course, this is not ideal, but that it is what it is. And they'll probably give you a free retake on a future test in, let's say, likely the fall. And so that wouldn't be ideal, but it's something to be ready for if we're talking about what are the worst case scenarios if something goes wrong. Probably they just give you a free retake in the fall if there were a technical glitch. So I've given you a link in the chat here to just LSAC's FAQ on digital LSAT prep if you want, if you want more on that. Someone's asking, for time prep tests this week, should we use only prep tests 80 and up or are the 70s okay? So I'll handle that part of the question first. Should you use only 80 and up? Well, it depends. If you've already done everything in the 70s, then yeah, I would focus on the 80s and up. On the other hand, if you want to do LSAT prep tests in the digital format and you're going on LSAC's site, they've got tests 71, 73, and 74 currently in the digital format. And so it might be worth doing one of those, even though it's in the 70s rather than the 80s, just to have it in the digital interactive format on LSAC's site. Overall, my answer is it doesn't matter that much. Both 70s and 80s are perfectly recent, perfectly relevant. And there is a value to maybe saving some of the tests in the 80s in the event that you'd want to use them for a future retake. So for some students who anticipate retaking, I might say, do every even numbered test from the 70s and 80s and save the odd numbered tests from the 70s and 80s for a future retake, perhaps in the fall. Now, the second part of this question was, there's been a shift in logical reasoning during the tests in the 70s and 80s. Can I clarify what, what that's about? Basically, I'd say the LSAT has gotten harder. That's really the only way I can truly articulate this, this change. They, they are very clever at presenting co common question types in an unfamiliar way. So it's your job to see what they're really getting at in terms of a question type or a term 
being synonymous with another one. So of course, like vulnerable to criticism means flaw, even though they're not using the word flaw, that's what they're getting at or the word justify meaning strength. And of course, the English, the English language is vast and complex. There are a million ways to refer to a, a particular concept. And so I can't exhaustively list everything, but as an exercise, you might want to go through a lot of the question stems from these exams and then look it up online and see which question type it was and see if your understanding of that question type matched what it actually was in the opinion of LSAT experts out there writing explanations or creating videos and such. So it's just gotten harder. It's something to get used to and practice on. And so I would recommend simply my general, general review process on any difficult question you encounter that you don't fully understand in the moment where you're not getting it right with 100% accuracy. So you want to ask yourself, was your misunderstanding stemming from the question stem or the stimulus or the choices? Did you proper, properly ID the conclusion versus the evidence versus any counter premises or filler information, background and such? If your misunderstanding was in the answer choices, what was it tempting about the wrong answer that made you pick it? What ultimately makes it wrong? What was discouraging about the right answer that pushed you away from it? And what ultimately makes it correct? And you want to go through that process again and again and again with everything you have difficulty with, everything you're not sure of, even if you got it right by guessing, it's still wrong in my book because it could have just as easily gone the other way the next time around. I could talk a bit about retaking because I imagine that those of you taking the LSAT in July will probably be going for the fall as well, or at least considering it because like I said, hey, why not? You could through luck alone do three, three or four points better. And if you don't, no big deal, but three to, four, four, three to four points better is huge. So I'd say common issues people encounter when it comes to retaking, they are worried they've, they've done every exam. And so part of the way to avoid that is, like I said, do only the even numbered ones now, the odd number ones later, or vice versa. But even if you have done everything recent or everything ever released, it's worth redoing these exams. The value in doing an exam is not simply to measure yourself, it's to learn from your mistakes. And let's say if you're getting it, getting it let's say you've, you've seen it before, but you still don't get a 180 on it on your second attempt, there is definitely something to learn there. Because after all, if you've seen it before and you know the right answer and you've reviewed it, why wouldn't you get it correct the next time around? It's because the LSAT's hard and your memory is not perfect. And that's fine. It's not anything to be ashamed of to get it wrong on a second go. But that means that there is value in redoing problems. And so people say, they can't study anymore because they haven't, they can't do anything new. I'd say, well, you've gotten things wrong again and again and again. There's clearly something you're missing and you have not fully learned from your mistakes. So there is room to improve your understanding of them. And aside from the numbered exams, there are plenty of unnumbered ones. There are 87 numbered ones now. The June exam is number 87. Then there's the unnumbered ones, June 2007, super prep exams A, B, and C. There's C2 in the Super Prep 2 book. There's also the official LSAT prep test with explanations, which is out of print, but available in the used and new section on Amazon. So you can find out of print copies there if you want even any, uh, something more. Fun fact is that the, this official LSAT prep test with explanations is the February 1997 exam, which was going to be unreleased most likely, but then it was stolen in an LSAT cheating attempt over 20 years ago when test takers in California hired, they hired someone to steal the test booklet for them. They flew to Hawaii, took the exam there, and was having someone send them answers via pager because this was 19, 19, 1997. And so as a result, LSAC released that exam and then they have never allowed electronics at the test since then. So if you're wondering why cell phones aren't allowed, that's a big part of the reason why. And so here's my list of every exam ever released if you're looking for more. Don't resort to fake LSAT tests. Don't resort to Barron's or Kaplan and Princeton Review where they're using fake LSAT problems. If a book does not say the actual prep test number and date administered, it's probably not real. A lot of companies like Barron's will use fake LSAT questions because they don't want to pay licensing fees. But the problem is that these questions contain mistakes, they're unrealistic, there are typos in the answer key or the questions. And so LSAT is hard enough without having mistakes in the questions themselves. So avoid those like the plague. As far as IDing your weaknesses is concerned, 
like I said, review, the review process is huge. Even if you, let's say you took the July, you're taking the July exam and it's unreleased. It doesn't really matter that much because you still have all your practice tests up to this point. You could simply take the most recent three to five exams that you've done, review those in depth and analyze them for your weak areas. And that would be enough to give you a good indication of where you stand and what you're missing. And like I said, you, and as far as diagnosing your problems, don't just look at what you got wrong. Also look at everything you had difficulty with. Even if you guessed and were down to two and you got lucky, it's still worth reviewing. Let's see, if you're looking to retake, you want to think about what you're going to do differently this time around. So if you've been working, you've been in school, you've got long hours, you've been taking 20 credits and doing multiple internships, and you haven't had enough time to study, and you're looking to take it in the fall, then the thing is to ask yourself is, what can you do differently now? How can you restructure your schedule now going forward to do things properly next time around? If you haven't you've been using all the resources you possibly could, if you've just been using you know, forums and blog posts and videos randomly consuming stuff online, Facebook groups and stuff, to consider using a more systematic approach if, you, if you've been thinking about tutoring or study groups but haven't actually done it, seek those out next time around if you think they could help you. If you've been jumping into exams without learning the basics first properly, I'd say start now by building the foundation first. I recommend a five-pronged approach to LSAT studying. I call it the laser approach, which is, and I'll type in the chat here, learning, accuracy, sections, exams, and review. So learning, accuracy, sections, exams, and review. Learning is theory, reading textbooks, doing drills, learning questions by type, building your foundation, just learning the basics. What's ordering games? What are grouping games? What are flaw questions? What are parallel questions? Reading the theory and maybe doing some drills. Accuracy is the next stage, which involves doing questions untimed by type, just in a row, using spreadsheets and categorizations to break them down bit by bit rather than doing random sections and random spreads of questions, doing 50 strengthened in a, in a, questions in a row, 50 weakened in a row, a dozen ordering games in a row, a dozen grouping games in a row. Next is sections, doing individual timed 35 minute sections to work on your pacing. This is also a great thing to do when you're working or in school and you only have a, a half hour or an hour here or there and not enough time to do a full length timed exam. Next is exams, which are where you build your endurance, doing full length timed five section exams, which will take you about three hours or three hours and 15 minutes or so, including the break. This is well worth doing, at least ideally 10 of them before test day, assuming that your timeline allows for that. If you're taking the exam in a week, you do not have time to do 10 exams between now and then, not even five exams. I would not do exa an exam a day. I would not do exams on consecutive days at most every other day, and ideally no more than two in a week. So if you're taking it in the fall, you have plenty of time to do 10 timed exams spaced out. Even just doing one a week would be great, along with detailed review and looking at weak areas as well, maybe doing some drilling, some sections here and there. And it's really important that your timed exams properly simulate test day conditions, meaning that you don't pause the clock to go to the bathroom, you don't take breaks that are off the clock, you don't chat with a friend, you don't check your phone, you don't check your email, you don't go for a walk, you don't go to the refrigerator. You ideally even have your gallon-sized Ziploc bag with your sharpened yellow number two pencils and your rubber rectangular eraser and your water bottle, your energy bar, your banana, your analog watch. That's it. You don't have your phone around. You don't have your friends around. You don't have your computer nearby. That's all you've got. And of course, you're using a tablet for the digital simulation. That's one thing, but there's no need to have your email open at the same time. And of course, if you are lax with yourself on any of these things, then your score may be inflated and you could be in for a disappointment on test day when your score comes back three to five points lower than you were expecting because you were cushioning yourself by giving yourself these little extra minutes here and there.
And of course, if you're doing paper, by the way, use your bubble sheet, use your Scantron to simulate the time that that takes. Last step is review, which I talked about a little bit before, but I'll repeat it just to be clear. The review process involves analyzing where your misunderstanding came from. Was it in the stimulus or the passage or the game setup? Was it in the question stem or was it in the answer choices? A lot of times folks will confuse necessary assumption for sufficient assumption, for example, or they will misidentify the conclusion. Sometimes an argument has a evidence, subconclusion, and main conclusion, and the subconclusion might include the word thus, but the main conclusion does not. Very tricky. So make sure that you properly identified the structure of the argument. If your misunderstanding was in the answer choices, you want to see what was tempting about the wrong answer that made you pick it and what ultimately makes it wrong. And what was discouraging about the right answer that pushed you away from it and what ultimately makes it correct. You want to do this again and again and again for everything you get wrong, everything you have difficulty with. Write this out. Write it out by hand, type it out, post it online, get feedback from others. You could even talk it out with a friend in a study group, talk it out with a tutor or an instructor. Whatever you do, at least articulate it in some way because it's too easy if you're just doing it in your head to gloss over your mistakes, gloss over your misunderstandings, look at the answer key or look at explanations and use them as a crutch and say, oh yeah, I get it now and move on. That is not enough. It's really important to really articulate for yourself where your misunderstanding was so that you can avoid making the same mistakes in the future. Because the LSAT has like a thousand different tricks in their, in their bag they could pull out. And you're not falling for all thousand of those tricks or else you'd be getting a 120. So you're doing better than that, than that presumably, meaning that you're only falling for certain tricks. But because the LSAT keeps repeating itself, if you fall for a mistake or a trick now, you will likely fall for it again in the future when it comes up again because we're only human our logic is not impeccable. We are fallible. And so you've really got to force yourself to figure out where your mistake came from so that you can avoid making it in the future. They really do dress things up differently in the future. It might be in the context of heart disease or climate change this time. And next time it could be about car crashes and dinosaur extinction. So it is important that you see the underlying logic within a question and don't get too wrapped up in the topic, but see, was this an ad hominem flaw? Was it correlation causation? Was it necessary sufficient confusion? Was it any one of a no number of other things that could come up? And so I just say, ultimately, this analysis is really important. Don't gloss over it. The proper review of a single exam should take a couple of hours at least. If you're reviewing, let's say the 10 that, or 15 that you got wrong, plus the 10 or 15 that you guessed on and got lucky or you weren't totally sure on. Of course, like I said, these things do repeat themselves. I know obviously you've got a lot of resources already, so I don't want to overwhelm you too much with additional resources, but I do want to at least make you aware of them in case you aren't. If you're looking to keep, entertain yourself during your commute, wherever you drive or take the subway, I've got two podcasts now. They're both LSAT Unplugged. One is a daily podcast and one is a weekly podcast. I'm putting the links for you here in the Zoom chat if you're looking for more. They are a mix of long and short episodes. The LSAT Unplugged Extended Podcast is longer episodes once a week. The other one is daily episodes that are a mix of longer and shorter if you're looking for more. So plenty of information there. Of course, I do also have the YouTube channel at youtube.com slash LSAT blog. I've got playlists on games, reasoning, reading comp, recordings of classes here in New York, uh, discussions with admission officers, a former LSAT question writer, coaching sessions. But honestly, you've got enough really in the course that I don't, you don't need to go beyond and the course is more cleanly organized for you. So I'd suggest starting there. But if you're looking for more, of course, it is available to you. And yeah, that's pretty much everything I've got for you here tonight. If no other questions, I will leave off here, but I want to thank you all for coming and for your engagement. All the best to those of you taking the July LSAT in just one week, and please reach out. Let me know how it goes if you're taking it. In the meantime, all the best and take care. Good night.